morning. Well, there was a comment on the floor last night, or actually I should say this morning, that uh, another vote on a certain issue will take place tomorrow. I said it is tomorrow. <laughs> For those of you that were watching C-SPAN, uh, most of us didn't get home uh, from votes uh, on the budget until pretty close to 2 a.m. And uh, I actually thought this hearing was starting at 10, but I saw that it was at 9. I may be the only member here this morning for the hearing, although I do I do understand that uh, Mr. Shimpis is uh, at a breakfast. I hope they have a lot of coffee. Uh, I understand that Mr. Engel is en route. I understand that Mr. Markey is en route, but I know Mr. Markey well, and there is a stop at Starbucks that he never fails to make. So we'll see if they have a long line or not uh, with this hearing. But I'm going to make the unanimous consent. And I did ask the, Mr. Chairman Barton. He gave me a big smile, but I know that he and he said he would be here. But I also know that he has been under the weather, uh, and, uh, under some medical. Uh, assistance with vertigo uh, that caused him to not get back from Texas until late uh, yesterday afternoon. So we're going to start. I will make the unanimous consent. Probably don't have to do that. <laughs> I'm just. But all member statements uh, will be made part of the record without a problem. And I will speak slowly, hoping that Mr. Engel will get here as his uh, office is just down the hallway. Uh, but anyway, today's hearing. I'm going to have one more sip of coffee. <laughs> it's not kicked in yet. Now, today's hearing is on H.R. 5126, the Truth and Color ID Act of 2006, bipartisan legislation introduced by Chairman Barton and Elliot Engel, who I commend both for their leadership, and I am delighted to be a proud co-sponsor of that legislation. Caller ID spoofing occurs when the caller fakes his caller ID information so that the number which appears on the recipient's caller ID screen is not the caller's actual phone number. In many cases, such spoofers are actually transmitting someone else's caller ID information instead of their own. And apparently, some spoofers just do it to play practical jokes on their friends. But in fact, there have been reports of much more sinister uses of spoofing. In some instances, spoofing is being used to trick people into thinking the person on the other end of the line is someone from a government agency or some other presumably trustworthy party. For instance, in this month's AARP bulletin, there is a consumer alert describing a prevalent scam where spoofers get the local courthouse's phone number to pop up on people's caller ID screens and then they tell the recipients of the calls that they are judicial officials in order to get the unsuspecting victims to divulge personal information like social security numbers, driver's, driver's license numbers, etc. Law enforcement officials are particularly concerned about senior citizens' susceptibility to such scams. Another reported case involved in a SWAT team surrounded an apartment building after police received a call from a woman who said she was being held hostage in an apartment. As it turned out, it was a false alarm. Caller ID was spoofed to make it look like it was coming from the apartment. Apparently, it was someone else's idea of a bad prank. In other instances, criminals are stealing credit card numbers, getting the phone number of the actual card holder, and then using those credit cards to use to get unauthorized wire transfers. In such cases, the criminal spoofs his caller ID information so that the number which pops up on the wire transfer operator screen is that of the actual card holders. And because such caller ID information matches the actual card holder's phone number on record for the credit card company, the wire transfer company uses it to authorize the wire transfer and thus spoofing enables the crime to be consummated. And of course, many of us are familiar with our own credit card companies, which may ask us to call from our home phones to authenticate and activate those new cards. And if the new card is stolen out of the mail, then criminals may be able to spoof our home num phone numbers and authenticate and activate our new cards from the convenience of their own homes or motel, or motel rooms or for whatever rock they might decide to crawl under. And while such spoofing has been technically possible for some time, 
it is used to require specific phone conversations and expensive equipment. However, with the advent of VoIP, Voice Over Internet Protocol, it has become easier for callers to transmit any caller ID information that the caller might choose. Moreover, there are online companies which offer spoofing services for just a couple of bucks to anyone on the phone. Unfortunately, nefarious uses of spoofing appears to be proliferating, and there is no law that actually protects the American public from it. The truth is, the Caller ID Act of 2006 would make spoofing illegal. More specifically, it would make it unlawful for any person to cause any caller identification service to transmit misleading or inaccurate caller, uh, caller identification information other than for authorized activities of law enforcement agencies and require the FCC to issue implementing regulations within six months of enactment. Today we'll hear from our witnesses about the problems of spoofing and their suggestions about how this bill, the Truth in Caller ID Act 2006, might be improved. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Appreciate you being here on time. And also my colleague from Nebraska being on time, Mr. Terry, if you'd like an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, not necessarily on time uh, by Michigan and Nebraska standards, but getting here at 10 after in D.C. is actually early for a meeting. I gave a long-winded opening statement just so that you could get here. Thank you. Uh, and I do appreciate you having this hearing, and it will be interesting to hear from the panel uh, regarding the Truth in Color ID Act of 2006. Uh, needless to say, coming from Omaha, Nebraska, where I represent uh, 30,000 people in the telecommunications uh, teleservices business, I'm concerned about how this act may affect those company, uh, companies and their employees. Um, many Fortune 500 companies use teleservices in my hometown, in my district, uh, in lieu of their own call centers and teleservices. So when they make an outbound call or inbound call, they answer it representing their client, XYZ company. Uh, that's not spoofing in my mind. Uh, that's not fraudulent. That's the client, and they should have a right to be able to speak on behalf of their client. Uh, so hopefully there's nothing in the Truth and Caller ID Act that prevents legitimate teleservices from doing their job on behalf of their clients. It's not fraudulent. Uh, so I think we need to kind of work through the details here, and that's why it's important that we have this type of a hearing. And I want to thank our panelists uh, for being here today to help us work through the issues of what's legitimate, uh, what's fraudulent. Uh, none of us uh, want uh, people to be able to fake identities, spoof, uh, in order to uh, make contact, but on the other hand, we don't want to stop legitimate commerce as well. Uh, with that, Chairman, I thank you for holding this hearing, and I yield back the remainder of my time. I thank the gentleman for being here. And uh, at this point, we, again, I made a unanimous consent request that all members will have their opening statements as part of the record. We have four very good witnesses today. Uh, Mr. Tom Navin, Wireline, Wireline Bureau Chief of the FCC, Ms. Stacy Price, Price, Vice President of Point One Communications uh, in Texas on behalf of Voice on the Net uh, Coalition. Mr. Lance James, Chief Technology Officer of Secure Science Corporation. And Mr. Mark Rottenberg, Executive Director of Electronic Privacy Information Center uh, here in Washington. We thank you all for being here this morning. And before I yield the time, Mr. Engel has just made it through the threshold for an opening statement. Again, I complimented you on being an original sponsor of the bill with Mr. Barton. Appreciate you being here. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I'm a poor substitute for Mr. Markey today. Uh, but I, I want to thank you for quickly scheduling uh, this hearing. Um, I really, as you know, have worked really closely with you, and um, I think you have been an exemplary chairman of, of this subcommittee. And I have no problem saying that publicly and privately as well. Um, I support this bill, obviously, to combat caller ID fraud, since I've added my name as the primary co-sponsor. 
uh, when we were finding out about these things. Uh, you and I had had uh, much discussion about it, as I had with Chairman Barton, and this really seemed like a no-brainer, this legislation uh, that really uh, should be supported by everyone in this Congress. Um, I strongly support, also strongly support, regular procedure. Uh, our colleagues are, are due the opportunity to learn about the issue as well and provide their own input. Um, the bill is a good bill. Uh, we need to continue to work uh, to improve it, and uh, I think that we will do that working across party lines. Um, I've been working with my colleagues for years now on issues of privacy and identity theft. Um, each and every time we plug one hole, crafty criminals come up with another way to commit fraud. Uh, recently on, uh, on television, I was asked that how come you can't uh, stay ahead of the curve of, with getting the, the bad guys, and I said, well, you know, the problem with this is they have to commit the fraud, and then we realize the things that they're doing, and we always sort of catch up with them. Uh, I've read news reports that criminals are using these technologies to get people who got private information that they would never give out except that they think they're receiving a legitimate call from their bank or a hospital or even a local courthouse or even Congress. Uh, I've also read about our colleague Tim Murphy being a victim in his capacity as a member of Congress, and then I heard that our colleague and committee member Heather Wilson has also been a victim. At this point, it became apparent to me that there are people who seek to use these technologies to strike at the heart of our democracy. They could well be planning to interfere with elections. That is an assault on the democratic process, obviously. Uh, leaving fake messages that are insulting or incendiary on a, on a public person's voicemail identifies the caller as an elected official or candidate for public office can threaten the very nature of our electoral process, and we can see how it could be used uh, politically uh, to try to... Um, uh, change or subvert the electoral process. Well, we've struggled to clean up our campaigns with greater disclosure and bans on soft money. Uh, we should not let that hard work be destroyed by a few unscrupulous actors. Uh, so the Truth in Caller ID Act gives us another tool to use to combat identity threat and even uh, election fraud. Uh, I thank the chairman uh, to his, uh, for his attention to this matter, and uh, I would like to ask unanimous consent uh, to enter into the record a letter uh, from the National Network to end uh, domestic violence. Uh, protecting victims of domestic violence has been a major issue for this Congress, and I agree with them that the Truth in Caller ID Act must not cause us to backtrack. So I, I ask a unanimous consent for that. Without objection? I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for your attention and look forward to hearing from the witnesses and yield back. Can I uh, come and yield back again? I thank you for your leadership on this issue, and I look forward to working with you as well as with Chairman Barton, moving this legislation uh, quickly through our committee and to the floor. And with that, I recognize the uh, distinguished chairman of the full committee, Mr. Barton. Thank you, Chairman Upson, for calling this hearing today on H.R. 5126, the Truth and Caller ID Act of 2006 introduced by myself and Congressman Engel. This bill is necessary to shut down the growing problem of manipulating caller ID information. Caller ID, so-called spoofing, occurs when a caller masquerades as someone else by falsifying the number that appears on the recipient's caller ID display. Everyone is familiar with the caller ID product that provides a consumer the name and number of who is placing an incoming call. Unfortunately, caller ID spoofing is yet another tool available to criminals to hijack the identity of consumers. For instance, the AARP recently ran a scam alert when someone posing to be a <coughs> courthouse employee called a Sterling, Michigan woman claiming that she had missed jury duty that week. The caller threatened that a warrant was being issued for her arrest and then asked to confirm her social security number to verify her identity. This scam can appear even more real when the con artist uses a caller ID spoofing product which allows the con to display the name and number of the courthouse on the caller ID box. As with other scams, the Internet is making caller ID spoofing even easier. There are now websites that offer subscribers for a fee a simple web interface to caller ID spoofing systems that let them appear to be calling from any number they choose. Some of these web services boast that they do not maintain logs and fail to provide any contact information. Some even offer voice scrambling services, which make the caller sound like someone of the opposite sex. Con does, does not necessarily need to utilize a spoofing website to manipulate caller ID information. Some providers of voice over internet protocol, or VoIP, services allow their customers to tinker with the caller ID information. 
Certainly this may not always be done for a deceptive or malicious purpose, but it offers those who wish to do harm an easier way to part consumers with their money. I understand that the FCC is currently investigating the caller ID spoofing problem, but I find it hard to believe that today there is no prohibition against sending false or deceptive caller ID information. H.R. 5126, the Truth and Caller ID Act of 2006, would remedy that problem in short order. 5126 specifically prohibits sending misleading or inaccurate caller ID information. It covers traditional telephone service as well as voice calls and provides a specific exemption for authorized law enforcement actions. I understand that there may be a need for additional exemptions, and I'm anxious to hear from our witnesses how the exemption issue should be handled as we move towards a markup. Consumers use caller ID services to protect themselves from unwanted calls and contact, including from those who may not want to do them harm. They should be able to rely on the caller ID information incoming to them in the caller ID box, and H.R. 5126 will do just that. I was one of the congressmen in the, that in the mid-90s made sure that caller ID was legal. There were members of this committee who didn't wish to make caller ID uh, a legal service. Thankfully, the majority of the committee then and now supports caller ID. I think the majority of this committee, with Mr. Engel's leadership, is going to make sure that we make caller ID exactly what we intended, that is a truth identifier of who it is that's calling your phone number. Thank you, Chairman Upton, for holding this hearing today, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank my chairman uh, not only for his statement, but also for moving the caller ID legislation a number of years ago. There is nothing, particularly at dinner time, when somebody calls, that to know exactly who it is so that we as consumers know whether we're going to take that call or whether we're going to have cold food for dinner. So very important. With that, your statements are made part of the record, uh, and we would, you know, would like you to Try and keep your remarks to not more than five minutes, at which point we'll, uh, when you're completed, all four of you, uh, we'll do questions. Uh, uh, and thank you for your travel and to get here promptly on time. Mr. Navin, we'll start with you. Good morning, Chairman Upton and members of the Senate Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about the problem of caller identification or caller ID spoofing. As we've heard, caller ID services let customers identify who is calling them by displaying the caller's telephone number or other information, such as a name or business name, on the customer's equipment before the customer picks up the phone. Caller ID spoofing refers to a practice in which the caller ID information transmitted with the telephone call is manipulated in a way that misleads the call recipient about the identity of the caller. The Commission is deeply concerned about reports that caller ID information is being manipulated for fraudulent or other deceptive purposes and the impact of those practices on the public trust and confidence in the telecommunications industry. We also are particularly concerned about how this practice may affect public safety in law enforcement communities. The Commission addressed caller ID on the Public Switch Telephone Network, or PSTN, in 1995 with Commission Rule 64-1601 which generally requires all carriers using the Signaling System 7 or SS7 protocol to transmit the calling party number associated with an interstate call to interconnecting carriers. The same commission rule also requires telemarketers to transmit accurate caller ID information. The development of Internet and IP technologies has made caller ID spoofing easier than it used to be. Now, entities using IP technology can generate false calling party information and pass it into the PSTN via SS7 with harmful real-life consequences in such areas as public safety. For example, as we've heard this morning, the Newark Star-Ledger reported that police in New Brunswick, New Jersey, shut down one city neighborhood for hours, evacuating buildings and closing streets as a SWAT team surrounded an apartment house. Police had received a call from a girl saying she had been handcuffed and raped in an apartment. And the call was, in fact, a hoax. This massive police deployment occurred because the caller ID had been spoofed to make the call appear to come from the apartment. Hoaxes like these divert our local public safety resources away from where they are so desperately needed, responding to real emergencies and real threats to our homeland security. I note that the committee is considering imposing restrictions on voice over internet protocol 
or VoIP providers that facilitate hoaxes and other harmful practices in caller ID spoofing. As you know, there are many varieties of VoIP, and the definition of VoIP in this bill, as well as other proposed legislation, is being interpreted to exclude many of them from the reach of the FCC. As the House of Representatives considers legislation affecting VoIP, you should be aware that a restricted definition of VoIP here or in other legislation might establish a statutory precedent that would restrict the Commission's authority to assist public safety and law enforcement in other contexts. At present, my colleagues in the Commission's Enforcement Bureau are actively pursuing the issue of caller ID spoofing. They've issued letters of inquiry or subpoenas to several entities who are apparently engaged in marketing and selling caller ID spoofing services to customers. The Enforcement Bureau continues to gather and analyze information about these companies' practices the networks, the businesses, and their customers, and other germane information, as well as analyze enforcement options, some of which may be limited as to entities that are not regulated by the Commission. In addition, the Enforcement Bureau has met with carriers, assembled internal technical experts to address the problem, and begun coordinating with the Federal Trade Commission regarding its efforts to address this problem. In conclusion, Intentional manipulation of caller ID information, especially for the purposes of fraud or deception, is a troubling development in the telecommunications industry. As Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau at the FCC, I share your concern about this practice. I look forward to working with this committee, other members of Congress, Chairman Martin, and the Commission to ensure the public maintains its confidence in the telecommunications industry. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you, Mr. Tice. Thank you, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Markey, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Stacy Pies. I am Vice President of Governmental and Regulatory Affairs for Point One, a VOIP provider, and President of the Voice on the Net Coalition, the Bond Coalition, which is the voice of VOIP in the industry. On behalf of the Bond Coalition, I thank the subcommittee for this opportunity to testify about this important issue. Before I address caller ID in particular, I'd like to commend Chairman Barton for his leadership in the committee and subcommittee taking action in the recent HOPE bill to accelerate the availability of VOIP and the ability to deliver E911 information along with 911 calls, particularly with respect to numbers, the creation of a National Emergency Routing Number Administration will assure that VOIP providers can obtain necessary pseudo numbers in a timely fashion. VOIP service providers who have made real strides in leveraging the power of caller ID to provide innovative services to consumers support this committee's effort to protect the integrity of caller ID functionality. We fully agree that strong action must be taken against those that intentionally spoof caller ID with the intent to commit fraud, deceive, harass, or otherwise create threats to life and limb, as mentioned by Mr. Engel. Congress is right to focus its attention on those who would do so. VOIP is burgeoning in popularity with consumers and businesses because it can do what plain old telephone service does, often much, much more. VOIP allows consumers to take control over their communications experience, to manage how they use those services, and to decide when and where they want to receive calls. With VOIP, I can direct certain calls to my work phone and others to my home or mobile phone. I can screen calls and designate some calls at specific times of day, for instance, during the family dinner hour, to be sent straight to voicemail. Some VOIP services even flash caller ID information on the TV screen, making it an easy decision to ignore the call in favor of C-SPAN. VOIP providers allow consumers to integrate technologies in innovative ways to bring the power and potential of the Internet to voice communications. Many of the great benefits of VOIP to consumers and business owners depend on accurate and non-misleading identification of the calling party. Businesses that use caller ID to call up a customer's account record so that it is immediately available to the customer service representative won't find the record very useful if it is the wrong record because the caller ID has been spoofed. At the same time, VOIP often allows users greater control over their personal privacy by allowing them to block their caller ID with the click of a mouse. 
Congress addresses deceptive spending, excuse me, spoofing, though, we urge you to keep in mind that in some legitimate instances, it can be necessary or desirable to change caller ID information where the purpose is not to mislead or deceive, or where the modification is necessary for a public purpose. The bill recognizes, for example, that law enforcement may need to mask the true identity of an originating telephone number. This is not the only legitimate need to change caller ID information. I'd like to share five examples. With reference to Mr. Terry, the FCC has created specific rules regarding what kind of caller ID information telemarketers should send in order to empower consumers to take steps to protect their privacy. Barring any change to caller ID information would prohibit compliance with the FCC rule. Second, one of the benefits of VOIP is that it can help a consumer better protect her own privacy and manage which of her personal information she presents to the world, irrespective of which communications device she picks up to initiate a call. Calls for different purposes, personal versus business, may merit different telephonic return addresses, as one might do with ordinary mail. This is not meant, however, to sanction masquerading as another. Third, there are also some situations in which caller ID information can endanger individual safety. Of course, as mentioned this morning, the classic situation is battered spouse. In some instances, blocking the delivery of caller ID information might be sufficient but any legislation should be careful about presuming that blocking will always be adequate. The fourth example is that in some circumstances, such as with forwarded calls, caller ID information needs to be altered to ensure that the original calling party's number is transmitted as the caller ID information rather than an intermediate number. And finally, as I referenced at the beginning of my remarks, for E911 systems, pseudo numbers need to be inserted and used as this committee has recognized in the Cope Bill. I'd like to close with three additional thoughts. First, spoofing a caller ID is not new. Tools have been widely available for years to spoof caller ID on traditional networks. As Tom mentioned, the Commission has already addressed these issues. One website even offers the ability to download spoofing software from the Internet, and then you can just use a common tape recorder to spoof the caller ID. Second, fighting misleading and deceptive changes in caller ID is only part of the solution. Companies handling sensitive information must also make sure they are handling that information with care. And third, misleading people through the misuse of caller ID, whether for a prank, a scam, or worse, is unacceptable. This committee is right to focus on those who intend to mislead. At the same time, though, legislation should not impose liability on traditional carriers or VOIP service providers to merely transmit what may turn out to be caller ID information. When good technology is used for bad purposes, we'd like to make sure it's the bad use of the technology, not the unknowing technology itself, which carries the burden. In focusing on those people who abuse caller ID technology, Congress can address the very real problem of speaking effectively in a cost-efficient manner that protects the proper use of this technology. Together with this committee's previous efforts to enable consumers to take advantage of VOIP benefits, we believe VOIP is positioned to help make communicating more affordable, businesses more productive, jobs more plentiful, the Internet more valuable, and Americans more safe and secure. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions I can. Thank you. Mr. James. Good morning. Hit that button. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Engel, and other members of the committee, I want to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, speak on this topic today, a very important issue. Um, as one of the founders of Secure Science Corporation, an Internet security and research company, I've personally witnessed the extent to which the abuse and misuse of caller ID can have. In August of 2004, our investigation team discovered that two of the nation's largest telecommunications providers, T-Mobile and Verizon, were vulnerable to a technique known as caller ID spoofing. This technique is entirely reliant upon the manipulation of caller ID to be successful and enables the attacker's access to individual customers' voicemails without using a PIN code, violating both customer privacy and authentication protocols to cellular, cellular and landline voicemail networks. Similar intrusions, also known as exploits, include unauthorized termination of customer accounts, anonymous automatic phone spam, and the potential to gain full administrative control over a major telecommunications network that serves both businesses and residential phone lines. 
This last possibility is one of the greatest concerns in conjunction with the unlawful uses of caller ID. It can even be viewed as a threat to national security in much the same way as a decentralization of a utility plant and transmission station control station can be. Other exploits in playing caller ID spoofing have been used by criminals who con unsuspecting victims out of money and in many cases their identity. Uh, these individuals are titled as fishers and the activity is uh, phishing, spelled with a PH. Uh, this activity involves the utilization of information gained illegally by breaking into a potential victim's voicemail account. This in turn allows the fishers to further victimize customers by using, for example, billing information, steal identities, and garner even more personal information from other sources. Conversely, fishers will use caller ID spoofing in order to pose as a victim's bank and push the account via phone. Uh, this same method is also used to lure wire transfer delivery searches, uh, services such as Western Union into authorizing uh, fraudulent transfers over the phone. Additionally, fishers will verify their access to the stolen accounts by using the victim's contact numbers in an attempt to validate account availability and amount, um, and amount by calling the banks themselves and, and speaking the caller ID as the user of the account. Because of the level and quantity of illegal activities participated in by fishers, anonymity is one of their primary objectives. Caller ID spoofing enables them not to only communicate covertly with one another, but also provides them with an advantage against law enforcement agencies. As a direct result, fishers continue their operations all the while evading subpoena attempts. The aforementioned instances are just some of the many ways in which the fraudulent use of caller ID are being employed today. The company's research alone demonstrates that more than 75% of the transactions and or speak calls made on providers' networks were with malintent. This was actually conducted by, we work uh, a lot with anti-fraud with uh, covert calling um, web services out there, just companies that do call already speaking, and we basically help them try to eliminate the fraud, but we're seeing about 75% of the activity is actually fraudulent. Uh, despite the dark side of caller ID speaking, there are very tangible benefits associated with this technique when used in a responsible manner. Secure Science Corporation is often called upon to assist companies who provide automated caller ID spoofing service to take and prevent fraudulent activity on their network. In order to do this successfully, it is not unusual for us to aid law enforcement by using caller ID spoofing techniques to track down these perpetrators. By accessing the very information they attempt to conceal, uh, fishers and other criminals are not successful in their evasive actions, thus increasing the amount of successful invest investigations with law enforcement involvement brought forth against them. Uh, we use a technique that actually allows us to track down the phone numbers they're using, and we have to use a caller ID manipulation technique to do these types of techniques. So there are some very legitimate uh, applications, especially in law enforcement. Uh, one of the most common reasons for the manipulation of caller ID information is executed by the vast majority of voice over IP companies, as well as the, those businesses which use private branch exchanges that are known as PBXs. In this case, they appropriately utilize the techniques to provide the telephone communications user with a viable and fiscally prudent alternative to traditional long-distance services. One such legitimate use of caller ID spoofing is the transmission of the caller's home telephone number on a voice over IP call. With respect to the positive and welcome uses affiliated with caller ID spoofing, such as research, investigative practice, and public services, it is my recommendation as a representative of the information security community that the exemption of this bill be either expanded to include the above mentioned uses or that the term illicit be added to the general wording of the bill. This way, the legitimate academic and commercial entities and the law enforcement agencies they aid will not unduly suffer the effects of this proposed act. The implementation of the Truth of Caller ID Act of 2006 will without a doubt prove to be instrumental in the fight against the criminal activities in and the abuse of our nation's telephone communication systems. By recognizing this bill as an amendment to the Communication Act of 1934, our government will continue to send the message to intolerance towards those who seek to take advantage of burgeoning technologies for illegal and or unethical use. Thank you very much. Five seconds to spare. You did very well. Mr. Rottenberg. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Upton, Mr. Engel, uh, members of the uh, subcommittee. My name is Mark Rottenberg. I'm director of the Electronic Privacy Information Center. We focus on emerging privacy issues. We appreciate the opportunity to be before the subcommittee again uh, and to testify on the Truth and Caller ID Act, H.R. 5126. From our perspective, there are two uh, different privacy interests at issue here. Uh, the first, of course, concerns the privacy interest of the person's telephone number uh, who would be disclosed to the call recipient. And there are many legitimate circumstances under which a person would rightfully not want to have their uh, telephone number disclosed. Uh, both Ms. Pies and, and Mr. James have described instances in, in their industry and in their research where they would also see uh, customers who would not provide their own 
uh, telephone number or, or would, for legitimate business purposes, uh, provide someone else's telephone number. But of course, there are also circumstances under which providing a number that is not your own uh, can lead to fraudulent activity, can place uh, public safety at risk, and so we certainly understand the intent of the bill's sponsors uh, to ensure that misrepresenting a person's telephone number does not enable any type of conduct that is criminal or, or puts the public at risk. Um, this debate is very similar, in fact, to the debate that took place when the caller ID service was originally authored. And as you may recall at that time, the Congress worked with the FCC and the state public utility commissions uh, to establish some privacy safeguards, such as per call blocking or per line blocking, to ensure that people who had a legitimate reason to withhold the disclosure of their um, telephone number uh, would be protected. So our view regarding this legislation is that it's appropriate to protect both privacy interests. And the way to do that would be to distinguish between the legitimate and illegitimate types of spoofing that might occur. And I think the simple way that you could accomplish this goal would be to add an intent requirement so that you would make the illegitimate uh, spoofing of a telephone number that which occurs with the intent to defraud or harass the call recipient. I think that would cover virtually all of the circumstances uh, that have been described so far and at the same time ensure that the legitimate uses uh, by businesses and by residential telephone customers uh, would be protected. Uh, I also indicate in the testimony that particularly with the introduction of new internet-based telephone services such as voice over IP where people will be uh, providing different types of information in the network environment, I think there are actually some First Amendment issues where people who might be broadcasting information over voice over IP service would have the right to withhold their identity, and I think that's an interest that um, the Supreme Court has recognized and certainly one that Congress uh, would not want to uh, prohibit uh, people from acting upon. So I think in addition to protecting the privacy of telephone customers, there are also important uh, free speech reasons why people should not be required to disclose their personal telephone numbers unless they intend to cause harm to engage in fraud or to harass. Um, there are, as you know, Mr. Chairman, statutes that are also available to punish those types of activities when they occur. Finally, if I may, I'd like to say just a brief word uh, about our filing yesterday at the FCC uh, regarding the recent disclosure concerning uh, the possibility that the National Security Agency may have established a large database on call detail information. I understand that this issue is a little bit outside the purview of the subcommittee, but at the same time it is very much related to this issue about the privacy of uh, telephone numbers. Uh, we have asked the chairman of the FCC, Mr. Martin, to open an investigation into the question of whether Section 222, which is the provision of the Communications Act that requires telephone companies to protect the privacy of the call record information they have obtained uh, has been uh, violated. Uh, we very much hope that the members of the subcommittee will support that effort. Uh, we know that Mr. Markey has already indicated that he believes uh, that the FCC should undertake an investigation of this matter, and Commissioner Michael Copps has expressed support for that as well. Um, anyway, uh, these are the main points on my testimony. As I said, I think it's important to distinguish between the legitimate and illegitimate circumstances uh, where caller ID spoofing might occur. And I'd be pleased to answer your questions. Well, thank you. Thank you again uh, for your travel uh, from the West Coast and Texas as well. Uh, I, I have a couple of questions, and we'll proceed now on uh, our five minutes and, and rotate among the members here. Uh, Mr. Navin, a couple questions uh, for you. Has the FCC actually gotten uh, complaints from folks uh, with regard to spoofing, and if, if so, how many? What has it come to your attention? And, uh, I, I've consulted with our uh, Consumer and Government Affairs Bureau, and they indicate that they've received approximately 20 uh, complaints, 20 more formal complaints on this, and perhaps uh, five times that number of inquiries uh, with regard to uh, call, call ID spoofing in general. And it, you know, when we passed the do not call list uh, a few years ago now, 
And of course, the FTC um, is, is the, you know, what we call to, to get on that list. And I don't know if you've have you chatted with your uh, counterparts at the FTC as, as it relates to this at all. They maybe should have asked the, the chair when she was here the other day uh, about that issue. Um, do you know if there's been any communication between the FCC and the FTC in terms of complaints that might have gone to them? I understand that our Enforcement Bureau has reached out to the folks at the FTC. Um, I, I don't know uh, the answer to your specific question about whether they are in doing any investigations themselves, but I know that they are uh, fully aware of our activities in terms of the, the companies that we've contacted and um, our efforts to gather more information about this problem, um, but I, I can't speak to what the FTC is actually doing. I would think that if this legislation were to become law tomorrow, that uh, these companies uh, uh, that are offering their services uh, to spoof would likely go out of business like that. Do you suspect that that's the case? Um, I really couldn't make a prediction on that. I think that um, to the extent that they are um, uh, you know, offering this service for the purpose of misleading, um, or um, defrauding the customer. I think that they very well may be captured by the legislation. As I understand it, you're, there's also uh, been some debate about adding an intent requirement, and that could certainly uh, play a role in um, uh, the Commission's ability to enforce the legislation. So I, I, I couldn't say for sure that everyone would go out of business. Let me ask, uh, um, you know, I really view this as you know, someone coming to your door. I mean, I like caller ID. Got it on my phone. You know, I know who it is. It's going to be for my son. It's going to be for my daughter. It's going to be the call. Going to be for my wife, me, or, or uh, whoever it is. And it's very much like when someone knocks on your door. Often you look out the little window or figure out who it is uh, uh, that's coming in. And uh, I don't know if the it, is the FCC, have you all ever thought about, do you think that you have the actual rulemaking ability uh, to do this without legislation? Or do you really need legislation to try and prevent spoofing from occurring? So certainly one of the challenges for the Commission as communications have migrated to Internet-based internet platforms has been the, the nature of the investigative targets where the Commission finds itself uh, calling on companies that have not been traditionally regulated by the Commission because they are not uh, license holders or um, um, entities that have been typically or historically regulated by the Commission. So I think that there there is some concern, there's always some concern uh, on the part of the Commission uh, relating to its enforcement for authority in the Internet context. And I think the uh, Commission would be uh, particularly concerned about any uh, restrictive definitions in, in the legislation uh, as it relates to VoIP service providers. I think that um, a restrictive definition in this context may have unattended consequences for the Commission in other contexts, including the public safety context and the law enforcement context. Thank you. Mr. Engel. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Navin, does the bill, in your opinion, give the FCC uh, the, all the authority it needs, or are there things we could possibly add that you think would, would be helpful? I would um, re repeat my, my comment about the uh, definition of VoIP service providers in this bill. Um, the definition of VoIP service providers in this bill uh, would seem to limit the Commission's flexibility to expand the definition to include um, one-way services, for example, or services that are not offered for a fee. I know that uh, the Department of Justice recently filed with the Commission um, in another docket, in the CLIA docket, its concerns about any definition of wood providers that is restrictive because of the substitution that's going on between communication services today. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Pies, um, I see in your testimony, as you mentioned, you think people would ignore the phone to continue watching C-SPAN. So I, my, my, my question to you is, have you been talking to my mother in Florida because she's the only one I know who does that? Uh, my father watches C-SPAN all the time and calls me and asks me why I haven't testified yet. So here I am. 
Well, when I come home, my, my, my wife says, she, she sees me turning on C-SPAN, and she says to me, after doing this all day, you come home and turn on C-SPAN, you've got to be kidding. But today's my anniversary, and I've been married 26 years, so something's been working. I don't know. Um, sir, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, She's watching right now. <laughs> that's why really I'm saying this, you see. Now, where's the C-SPAN camera? That's a nice gift. Congratulations. Uh, Thanks. Um, uh, seriously, though, I, I want to uh, commend the uh, VOIP providers. Um, it's an exciting technology, and uh, many uh, thousands of my constituents have started using Cablevision's Optimum Voice service. But I understand that there's no standard for uh, VOIP providers when it comes to caller ID. So I want to ask you, do most programs let someone manually enter any caller ID information they want? I can't speak for most VOIP services. I do know that a number of residential services that are designed essentially to replace your plain old telephone service um, only permit the user to have the numbers that are assigned to them. So, for instance, if I can select one number or if I can select five, those are my five numbers and I can use any of them, they are my numbers. Um, some services that again may be unlawful or illegitimate may not stop that, but I don't actually have knowledge of who those providers might be if that happens at all. Thank you. Is the, is the voice industry working toward a standard for how to handle this so that it w would be uniform? That's an interesting question. Um, there are, um, there's a lot of different standards that are used to transmit calls that originate IP. In many instances, IP originated calls do not have a standard telephone number associated with them. And in those instances, there are, um, not standards, but uh, international requirements that the provider can use a different code um, to transmit, and that code is, I believe, 00012345. Um, because VOIP calls do not have the same tie to geography that uh, plain old telephone calls have, the phone number is, in many instances, irrelevant. Um, and so rather than retrofitting our networks, to add a phone number that has no meaning. Um, providers often don't engage in any change or manipulation at all. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mr. James, um, if you could see one thing added, uh, removed, or changed in this bill, what, what would it be? I would honestly focus on the intent behind the bill, and the reason I say this is because if you look at other crimes that exist um, on the Internet, such as spam or phishing, uh, the the techniques that are used for phishing are very common. An example, from a, you know as layman as possible, I will try to be: you can mirror a website, you can set up a spoofed email, you can then send out the mass mailing. If you look at all three of those techniques specifically, all three of those are legal when they are used legitimately. You can mirror a website. There's nothing wrong with that. You can spoof your email if you're showing someone a demonstration. People do it all the time when they change their identity on their email for multiple mail accounts. You literally are just changing their email address, but it's going through a different web mail server. And on the third one, um, you, you can do the same uh, mass mailing with bulk mail campaigns for marketing that have a thin list and all those such things. So uh, there's really two things that I would focus on. I agree with um, Mr. Navin on the VOIP needs to be broadened, the definition. And the reason why is we have to also look at successors to VUIP in the sense of um, smart homes is a good example. Uh, not all of them are two-way. What if you bring a, a, a home alert safety system to your grandmother and you want to just use VUIP to do the intercom system over the Internet and say, are you okay? That's a one-way system. Uh, so VUIP could still be utilized in that, and that's one way. So I think that we should open that expansion a little bit. Uh, I would recommend going to the U.S. Patent office, looking up the definitions of VOIP are defined there, and start maybe using those type of techniques uh, there. Another thing that I would see to expand on the bill possibly is um, agreeing with Mr. Rottenberg on the legitimacy and illegitimacy uh, concepts. 
The reason why is um, one of the things that I should I think that might want to be added to the cause of illegitimate activity is that the, the, that teeth need to be added to this bill. And what I mean by that is that technology should be in place in telecom providers to help detect illegitimate activity, so that you can actually enforce these. Because caller ID spoofing is is essentially anonymous in many cases, and it becomes very difficult to track down. If you would just indulge me, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask Mr. Rotten for the same question. Um, I know you mentioned it in the testimony, but if you want to add anything, if you can see one thing added, removed, or changed in the bill, what would it be? Um, Mr. Engel, I think adding the intent requirement is, is the key uh, uh, addition, uh, and what that effectively does would be to distinguish between the people who are spoofing with malintent and the people who are spoofing with legitimate business purpose or privacy interest. I think virtually all the witnesses have made a similar point, um, so I hope it's a change that the subcommittee would make. All right, well, thank you. Mr. Navin, do you want to add anything? I know we, we've talked about the FCC, and but is there anything else that you would want to add uh, about um, the bill? Um, if you could see one thing added, removed, or changed, what would it be? I think I would emphasize that the Commission will uh, take all steps that it can possibly take to, to implement the legislation, however Congress determines to, to pass it. But I think it's important, particularly the, the definition of, of what services in the bill, that the, um, the definition does not um, unnecessarily restrict the Commission's authority as it relates to solving this problem as well as other problems that the Commission uh, faces, including 911 and law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Terry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll go back to my opening statement. I guess the specific question is the bill is written now. Under this assumption, a uh, teleservices company uh, has a contract with XYZ Corporation uh, to do outbound calls uh, trying to get them to subscribe to more credit card services, let's say, for example. And the telemarketing services located in Omaha, Nebraska, the client is located in New York City, uses the general number for their client as the caller ID number. So the intent is to use a different number, but one of their client. Mr. Navin, then I'll go down the panel. Uh, so we have the intent to use a different phone number. Is that conduct spoofing under this bill? And then uh, after that, should it be or should it not be spoofing? As I understand it, the, the focus on that bill is misleading or inaccurate caller ID information. Uh, based upon the commission's existing rules, uh, that the Commission adopted in 2003 in the do not call proceeding. Um, it doesn't seem to me that um, the hypothetical that you gave would, would fall uh, within the definition of inaccurate or misleading information. Indeed, under the commission, Commission's rules, any person or entity that engage in telemarketing uh, must transmit caller ID information. Um, any person or entity that engage in tel engages in telemarketing is prohibited from blocking the transmission caller ID information. Um, the telemarketers may, however, substitute the name and phone number used or billed for making the call, the name of the seller on behalf of which the telemarketing call is placed and the seller's customer service telephone number. So uh, according to the Commission's existing rules, uh, which I think we designed to get at uh, the issue of inaccurate or misleading information, um, uh, I don't think that uh, your, your hypothetical creates a, a problem. All right. So there's nothing in this bill that would uh, then, in essence, create an issue of trumping your regulatory language? Uh, I, I don't believe so. I mean, certainly if, um, uh, you know, if necessary, you can specifically uh, make reference to the Commission's rules and uh, preserve the Commission's existing rules in this regard to ensure that uh, telemarketers are not captured by this legislation. The other three, I want, I'll ask it in a different way, and that's just, is that a legitimate business practice for a telemarketer to use the, the caller ID number of their 
of their client instead of it having to come up X, Y, Z, uh, telemarketing. I'll just let you go down whether that's acceptable or whether that's fraudulent. Not only is it acceptable, and as Mr. Nathan mentioned, required by the FCC's rules, um, it is uh, an enabling feature of the OIP technology. As you know, um, it's not just in the telemarketing business, but it allows jobs to be insourced to rural areas, to people who may not be able to get out to a call center. They can actually work from home rather than their home number showing up. It would be a central phone number that shows up. So it's actually a very important feature. Um, I'm not sure that the legislation as it's drafted today actually gets at an allowing it. Um, probably if you went back and included intent language as we've discussed, um, that, that would be very helpful. Um, the answer to this is um, it's, it, it is definitely applicable in marketing, uh, whether it's telemarketing or some other. And I will give an example of that um, two days ago I saw Bank of America email talking about their partnership with eHealth Insurance. It was sent by a third party, but it said it was from Bank of America. But if you go through the mail headers, it's not really sent from Bank of America's system. It's actually sent from their marketing you know, third party vendor. Um, so in a case such as this, it, yes, this is a very legitimate use. And I think that um, agreeing with virtually everybody as well on this panel that legitimate needs to be defined. Um, if you look at the bill today, um, it technically could surpass because one would argue misleading. Well, we're not misleading. We are calling on behalf of our client. And technically that falls under, you know, this bill that says that, you know, we're not misleading anything. But I would want to clarify that further along so that, you know, we're not even having to go to a, you know, uh, hearing about it and debating the issue or, or going to court on this issue uh, so that it's more defined. Mr. Chair, I actually disagree with uh, Mr. Navin's assessment about how the language should be interpreted uh, in this bill. He's referring to earlier legislation and rulemaking that was explicitly enabled by that statute for the FCC to develop regulations and to interpret terms. Uh, this bill, which is before your subcommittee, is first of all more recent in time. Secondly, it doesn't incorporate the earlier definitions. And third, it creates no rulemaking authority for the FCC to do so. And, you know, at first impression, if a court looks at the language of this statute, this statute prohibits making a call in which misleading or inaccurate caller identification information is provided. I think those words are fairly straightforward. So in the absence of similar authority for the FCC to conduct the rulemaking and interpret those terms, I think it would not provide protection for the type of teleservices you've described. And I think the better approach would, in fact, be to create an explicit intent requirement that would protect businesses that are not engaging in fraudulent or harassing activity. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rodenberg, just briefly on the, uh, the issue of surveillance, uh, you, you indicated that it's a good idea for members of Congress to weigh in on this. What would you suggest by strategy in that regard? Well, Mr. Inslee, we would very much appreciate uh, support from this subcommittee, members certainly of both parties, uh, encouraging Chairman Martin to open an investigation as to whether Section 222 uh, was violated. You know that earlier this year, uh, hearings were held on the question of pretexting, which is a way in which people's uh, personal telephone numbers became available for sale on the Internet. And a lot of good work was done in this committee, and Chairman Martin testified about the importance of protecting the privacy of those records. Uh, very similar issues, but of course on a much larger scope, have arisen now in the context of the domestic surveillance program. And we hope that Chairman Martin will be encouraged to pursue this investigation. I'll join others in doing that. Just so you know, I'll be bringing an amendment, a little bit related issue on the Defense Department Appropriations Bill that will prohibit the expenditure of taxpayer money 
for electronic surveillance that does not comply with the FISA law. So we'll be having a debate on the House floor here in a, in a few weeks. Thank you. Mr. Engel, do you have additional questions? Well, I have just one uh, kind of uh, lighthearted question. Um, I understand that our uh, computer engineers are working on what's called Internet 2. Um, I really, to tell you the truth, don't know a lot about it, but I believe it's supposed to be an upgrade, um, like going from Windows 98 to XP, and I'm sure we'll be hearing, we'll be holding hearings on it. Um, my question is to anybody, do any of you know if Internet 2 will help this situation that we're talking about today or, or possibly make it worse? Mr. James. If I may, um, I don't think that Internet, Internet 2 is technically a medium for communication. Um, I was kind of thinking about when we were going through this, when I was going through this bill um, about, you know, one of the reasons why I agree with Mr. Naven about expanding is we can get into a predecessor scenario of UIP working on an IPX protocol instead of the standard internet TCP IP protocol. And that would basically not be covered by this bill because it specifically says TCP IP. Uh, and I was actually thinking if Internet 2 is one of the examples is what happens there. Is it going to be using the same protocol? Will it be defined in this bill? Um, I don't think that Internet 2 is going to necessarily secure the techniques against caller ID spoofing um, because I don't, the problem is that a protocol layer for, of the actual, you know, VOIP, um, without being technical, it's, it's basically a session, session initiation protocol. It's basically this specific protocol. And that's where the weakness lies. It doesn't really matter what it communicates on. Um, if there is, if Internet 2 does bind to, like, cryptographic communication per every, you know, every communication it ever makes, an authentication on every little communication the computer may make, and so it's accounting and uh, accountability and auditing trails and all this, there's a very good chance that you could stem it down because of the fact that you track the activity itself. But unless it does something like that, which I don't believe it does at this time, uh, it's not going to be much more effective. Thank you. If we have hearings about it, we should call you back again. Any, anybody else? Mr. Engel, I just wanted to mention that um, the committee or the subcommittee should approach the definition and what it encompasses cautiously. Um, certainly, Congress should want to ensure that any legislation enables new technology and the new features that are so important for both residential users and businesses rather than stifling technology. And the concern that the VOIP industry has is not um, certainly any desire to get out of obligations or to ensure the safety and security of our nation, but it is that we won't be able to continue to make the investments that will bring these transformative technologies to consumers. And so it's not a specific request, but just sort of a word of caution. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again for your leadership on this issue. Mr. Naven, I have one last question, and that is that if we were to add a clause or uh, intent to defraud as part of this uh, legislation standards in the bill, how would that affect your efforts to enforce the law? I think that um, from the Commission's vantage point, anytime you add an intent standard, um, it puts an additional evidentiary burden on the Commission in its enforcement process. So I think it would make it um, more difficult to enforce. The Commission would certainly take um, all steps necessary to enforce the law, but I think it would indeed make it more difficult. And uh, with that, I will yield to my friend, Mr. Markey, in the nick of time. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Naven, is it? Uh, in your testimony, you note that the Commission addressed caller ID on the public switch telecom network in 1995 with a rule which requires all carriers using signaling systems 7 to transmit the calling party number associated with an interstate call to interconnecting carriers. Did the recently granted Verizon forbearance petition remove this requirement for Verizon? 
the, the Verizon forbearance petition uh, sought um, flexibility from certain common carrier regulations. Um, I don't specifically recall whether they enumerated this regulation in, in their petition. Um, the, that petition, um, um, uh, the commission did not deny that petition within the statutorily defined period of time. And according to the statute, if the commission fails to take action, the petition is deemed granted. So um, I don't know whether they specifically enumerated this regulation in their uh, petition. So, so, so they did not grant forbearance from all of Title II. Is that what you're saying? Uh, my recollection is that there were certain obligations that um, Verizon um, uh, carved out of its app, of its application. And uh, I know, for example, in an ex parte in the beginning of February, they made it plain to the commission that the petition did not include um, asking the commission for removing the Section 254 obligation, which is the universal service obligation. I also know that in um, one of those ex partes, they restricted the uh, scope of the petition to exclude certain uh, special access services that they're providing today. So, so I, just, I, don't, I don't know if they specifically you don't know. included this. Okay. Um, did they list Section 222, the CPNI section? In, in the original petition, they asked for relief from all common carrier regulation. Uh, Section 222 is in the, the body of law under Title II of the Act. So I think it's uh, certainly arguable that they included um, or intended to include this within the scope of the petition to the extent they were seeking to get out from Title II. Okay, so, um, so many of us are concerned about allegations that carriers circumvented the Section 222 customer privacy rules and gave calling data to the NSA. And yet the FCC recently granted Verizon the right to avoid these rules and many others when it granted through inaction the Verizon forbearance petition. Mr. Rotman, could you comment on that? Thank you. Um, we're obviously concerned if the telephone companies are trying to get out from under the Section 222 obligations, particularly, as you know, in light of the recent uh, allegations. We're not uh, familiar with the Verizon Forbearance uh, Petition, but I will point out that this provision of the Communications Act traces its roots actually to the original passage back in 1934. <coughs> when telephone companies were asked to ensure that the privacy of their customers would be protected. So obviously this would be a great concern. Okay. Mr. Navin, when do you expect to complete the notice of proposed rulemaking on CPNI? I believe that uh, we've received comments in that proceeding. Um, but we have not yet received reply comments. I think that we would um, wait until the record closed before we began the process of presenting options to the commissioners. Um, I think that the reply comment period closes either later this month or early in June. So I think that we will begin to brief the commissioners and present options to them uh, sometime thereafter. Okay. Um, and I'd ask you just, Mr. Rotenberg, if you could just tell me the, if you could just summarize the one thing you want us to remember about the issue that we're dealing with in the hearing today. Well, Mr. Mark, on the legislation before the committee, we feel very strongly that an intent requirement needs to be added to distinguish between the legitimate and illegitimate uses for caller ID spoofing. And as for the other issue you raised, uh, we very much support the effort to encourage Chairman Martin to conduct an investigation to Section 222 and the allegation that information was improperly disclosed. Well, I've, I've asked the chairman of the FC, I've asked Chairman Martin to give us information as to what exactly has taken place in the relationship between the telephone companies and the um, NSA uh, so that we can have more information to determine whether or not any privacy laws have been uh, violated or any other laws that passed by this committee uh, that uh, 
uh, may have been uh, violated. So um, but thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much for this lively uh, and um, entertaining I didn't hearing. see your Starbucks uh, cup there. And uh, which probably means I'm not really awake even as I'm <laughs> sitting here at this point. But uh, I thank you for the hearing, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate your testimony. I, I would say that uh, it's my understanding that it's likely that we'll move to a markup relatively soon on this uh, bill before the full committee and appreciate your, your input and your thoughts and we look forward to continuing on a bipartisan path.